give another couple, another 30 seconds and we'll get going. Okay, picking up where we left off. Uh, ju just to show you where this event is happening. So we're here in the southern part of the San Francisco Peninsula. <clears throat> this area this is a false infrared image. This is essentially grassland, this, this um, uh, uh, beige colored stuff. There's a couple wetlands here. There's wetland here and here and, and seasonal lake and things of that nature around. So it's scattered around. This area right here, I'm blowing up, and this is um, this is the uh, 101 freeway right here, and um, this is um, or sorry, that's not the 101. What is that? It's a 24. I think it's a 24. Um, anyway, this is uh, uh, Stanford University. The main campus is over here. This this uh, area right here is called is that lake area, the Lake Lagunitas, that place where the 360 camera uh, images or, or the 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 uh, 360 views still images I told you from the 1800s um, was were taken, and this was uh, a, an area that I was in charge of uh, restoring for um, some number of years. Okay, so that's the same area. I'm just zooming in. So for purposes of this discussion today, I'm just going to call this area the reserve area in Piers land. So this is all university land, but this chunk over here was leased out to a a rancher and his family, he, he um, uh, grazed it. it. There's still being grazed, but his family grazed it for a, at least 80 years. So this was a multi-generational um, ranching operation. Um, and these are, again, rolling uh, foothills, coastal foothills. Okay. Um, this area we call it the dish because on the top of the ridge line here is uh, one um, big and, a, and a, another slightly smaller uh, satellite dish that's used to communicate with uh, deep space probes and things of that nature. <clears throat> okay. So uh, again, reserve land, no current cattle grazing, pierce land where uh, it, it, uh, there is active cattle grazing. So, uh, and, and, if, and you guys can probably see the difference between the two sides, yeah? In terms of oak trees? Yeah. Okay. Comparatively speaking, lots of oak trees. Comparatively speaking, not so much, right? So why is that? Well, maybe we can get some insights here and use this to help guide our restoration. Let's say we wanted to get more uh, wetlands and, and um, uh, oak woodlands on this side, let's say, or maybe more in this, in this area. So when I started uh, going around and asking uh, people, and so this is, we're looking at the ridge line now, Again, on this left side here, where the cattle uh, don't are, are, aren't found as often or, or at all, unless they escape. Uh, this is you see lots of oak trees. This side, where cattle are were frequent, not many oak trees uh, to be seen. And so, when I would ask uh, the the long time owner, he'd say, "I say, well, so how long does it look like? It's as long as I can remember," he used to say. And then he'd like shoot his gun towards me. Um, uh, and then, and then I'd say, you know, well, so I'm trying to understand this a little better, and I don't really get it. And it seemed like this place in this little a valley it seemed like it'd be a good place for um, for oaks. And and he said, that's the damn soils over here. Just, there's just not not good soils on this side of the hill. And as we look at this uh, grassland, maybe we maybe there's a little bit of that. This looks like some shallow rocks here. So this sort of looks maybe like a serpentine formation or something. Looks like the grass is a little browning here as compared to this other area or browning a little quicker or something. So, okay, maybe there's something to the soil, maybe, maybe, maybe not, but, but okay, I guess. Um, but very rapidly after I started doing work up there, uh, it was just obvious that there was something else going on. So this is a transect tape I laid out. And then I was counting some, surveying some grass. And in the middle of my counting it, all of a sudden the, the transit tape started moving. I was like, what the heck? And I looked back and this cow was eating it. So bastard ate my transit tape. Um, so they ate a lot of things, right? So if they eat a plastic transit tape, maybe they could also eat a baby, uh, a baby uh, um, um, 
sorry, somebody's calling me. Baby, um, uh, oak tree. And then here's another one of my survey points. So here's, I've, I've, I've put my uh, transect tape down and I've run it out. And here's an area where the cattle have access in the foreground. Here's where they don't have access. Hmm, it's as if, it's as if grazing might have something to do with the distribution of trees. What, what do you think? Um, and so, okay, so, so we can use um, this historical approach to guide our restoration. Here's how we can use it quantitatively. We, we saw before how we could put out a distribution map. Maybe we can also help it ha have history help direct us to where we would actually do plantings. So the approach I took here was I used five aerial photos um, from uh, beginning in 1928. So looking straight down, photos from an airplane. Um, and they're roughly spaced every 14 years or so. Um, uh, most of them. Um, there's there's obviously some more significant gaps, but but you know, at least a decade or so in between each photo. Um, they're georeferenced, so we knew exactly where they were in, in space. And what I what I try to do from this is look at total cover, individual recruitment, and how many trees were dying. And so this is what it looks like. So here's a, an image of the same site from 1948. And I think maybe one of the first things you guys notice is just like before. Yeah, it seems like there's more trees on this side and, and less trees on this side. So this gross pattern at least seems to be, you know, the way it's, the, the way it's been for, you know, many decades. Um, and as we go in, we can actually, so in this case, this big chunk of stuff can't, um, we can say there are, are trees there. But occasionally when we get images like this, right? Um, we can, so I can't tell how many oak trees are here, right? It's just a big closed canopy. But check it out, this one, I could tell from this image at this particular time in this location of the image that there's an individual tree, right? I can tell there's an individual tree here, an individual tree here, et cetera. So um, I could potentially follow these individuals. So I could look at how successful they've been. Are they surviving from time period to time period? Again, not these individuals, but these more isolated ones in the grassland savanna. And, and did this and, and actually I didn't, I had my technicians do it. And so, you know, I had, I had, uh, had my, 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 my monkeys do it, as we say, we call our crew, we call the Creek monkeys because we love to fall off of trees into water, but that's another story. Um, okay, so, so this is the percent cover over time of, of these, these areas. And again, this is the reserve area where, uh, there were not cattle historically in, in the area where cattle uh, actually did have access for a long time. And so we see, um, this is the pattern we see. And if we look at what's gone on in terms of survivorship, where we have those individuals, right? So this is, this again is all oaks. This is aggregate oak, oak condition. This is looking at the individuals, the, the, those, those individuals that weren't in a closed canopy, but they were isolated, we could follow them. So this is survivorship, okay, on Pierce land. So that means the individual was present at year one, and then the next time period we looked at, it, it, it was also there, it survived, yeah? On uh, the, the grazing areas and on the reserve areas. Now, if these were the same, they would fall out more or less along this line of unity. You guys with me on that? So that uh, so that as as it generally goes up in one side, it generally goes up in the other side. If survivorship was greater on average in the reserve area, we would see more dots on this side of the line. If survivorship was greater on the um, uh, the, the grazing side, we would see more dots on this side of the line. Does that make sense? Are you with me so far? In, in that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. And so, uh, and generally, I mean, it, it's, you know, for, for purpose right here, just eyeballing it, man, eh, we don't know if this was significantly different, but, but there does seem to be more dots on, on, this, on this side, yeah? But check out the recruitment. The recruitment would be babies. The recruitment would be individuals that, um, that were new in the image. Now, to be clear, when I say recruit, um, there may be an individual right here that's so small, we just can't see because of the resolution of this photo. Right, so by recruitment, I mean recruited to the size that we could see it. This doesn't mean necessarily born per se, but this means recruited to the size class recognizable by aerial photography 
of the resolution that was used back in the day. Okay, and so here, check it out. Here, um, uh, we've gone from, uh, so the same thing, right? Line of unity. If these, if the recruits were about uh, equal or the rate of recruitment was about equal on both sides, the dots would fall out or the, the data points would fall out along the line of unity. We do not see that at all, right? We don't need to even need any statistics here, right? We have, we have everybody here that there's greater recruitment. So for example, in this particular year, we're seeing about, um, about, four, about 0.4 individuals per hectare recruiting in on the, the non-grazed area versus something like about 0.15 individuals recruiting in the grassland, <clears throat> excuse me, in the grassland per hectare uh, in um, uh, the grazed area. And this is what this looks like if we put it into a GIS and well, it wasn't a GIS, but, but if, we, if we use some Krieging. So this is recruitment over the whole 70 years. So of all those different photos, uh, all, the in, all the new times we saw babies, right? Where were they? And so the darker the color, there were more babies. The lighter the color, there were fewer or no uh, baby oaks uh, recruited in, no seedlings recru recruited in. And then this is sort of the same, a similar idea. This is survivorship. So this is when we did see an individual, how many of those individuals continued to survive. So the darker color means increased survivorship. So again, same story you're seeing. Um, there, there's more babies being born on this area and there's more uh, individuals that were alive surviving to the next time period in this area. Um, okay. Um, okay. So then what we can do is we can take this data, we can take these, these aerial photographs, take a digital elevation model. And so most of you have taken GIS, so this should make sense. There might be a couple of you that haven't yet taken our, our GIS, but this is just a, a three-dimensional representation of the surface of the, of the ground surface. And we stretch, that, stretch those images over. This is very similar to our structure from motion stuff that we do now with our drones when we do mapping, but this is, when I did this 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago, this was, this was high tech. This was cutting edge technology back in the day. And I had to explain this to people a lot. Um, okay, anyway, so then the, what do we see? Um, we look at woodland cover. Um, we see an interact, we see um, differences, okay? So what we see is um, the, uh, the um, reserve behaves the same throughout time in terms of, um, how the oak trees were distributed, but the oak trees on the reserve area, so yeah, sorry, but the oak trees on, on pierced land area, these dotted lines change significantly through time. So there's a significant interaction. So there's, so there's grazing influences at the landscape scale and there's something interacting with topology. And so what do we do? We, this is, we're not in a GIS class, but essentially we threw this in and we looked at all these different parameters of the topology. If maybe there's something about the surface that can explain where these critters are uh, recruiting to or surviving to, where these oaks are surviving to or, or, or et cetera. Um, and so we used uh, the mean and standard deviation, but because um, for example, aspect is funky, we had to use a thing called circular standard deviation, which it turns out at the time, um, ArcGIS didn't properly calculate and we had to do all kinds of crazy stuff to get it. But th this is what we see. So we can start to overlay these aspects on here and figure out uh, uh, with each of these individual parameters, what explains uh, the oaks in terms of those parameters and then add them all together and try to predict where we think we would see oaks based purely on the, the topography. And this is what we see. So from this, from these physical characteristics. Okay, so we used the historic um, conditions to tell us where recruitment was best, where, where cover persisted the longest over these decades, right? So we used that data, then merged it with some of our modern information in the case, this case of topography, and then merged those together to figure out what are the best places? What are the places that oak trees are most likely to recruit and or where are the places where oaks are most likely to survive? And so that's what we get here. So here we have in, in, in um, uh, different pixel sizes, different, different uh, spatial resolution here, but we have core areas. So the core areas, the green, are where we predict if we planted oak trees, they're gonna do the best, right? They're gonna be most likely to survive. Um, areas where they are um, 
uh, likely to do okay and areas where they are probably not gonna do so well, right? So areas outside the, um, the, 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 the best of the performance. And so we can then use this as a, to target a restoration. So if we're gonna go plant some trees, again, changing nothing else, we're gonna change, plant some trees in our current environment, where do we wanna direct our efforts to have maximum success? And so we would have the, these green areas, we'd have maximum success. If we wanted to say, hey, maybe we wanna push it a bit. Maybe we can start to push into the yellow area. Maybe by, for example, um, 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 uh, fencing off some of these areas and not letting the cattle be there. We could go into maybe some of the yellow areas, which are okay. They're not they're not maybe the core area, but they should be you know somewhat decent, and we would have better luck, let's say, in this little yellow chunk than in this area over here, right? So we can use this data to guide us. So a mix of history and a mix of existing conditions, and that's in fact what we did, and and we use this to guide where we started our initial um, plantings. So that's how we can begin to get a feel for what do we want to do with our restoration. We can look at some old photographs. We can look at the existing tolerances of, say, our plants. What's the salt level they need? What's the amount of irrigation or, or, or soil moisture level they need? And then say, ah, I can either manipulate that in, there, in this location and therefore plant this, say, tree here or this, this wetland plant here. Or maybe I don't have the money to do that, the resources, I'm not going to be able to do that. So therefore, I know that this site wouldn't be good to plant that tree or it would be, would be uh, not super likely to have a success if we planted it here. Cool. Does that make sense, you guys? Questions about that? How would you guys address the, um, the bald spot in the center or like places where oak trees are not? Okay, uh, great. So the question is, right, good question. So the question is, hey, like in this, in this uh, bald spot, I take it that's directed at me. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, so this, this area here, uh, say this, this, this non-colored region where there currently are not oak trees. So it's oak bald, it's bald oak or something. Uh, uh, and, and how might we get them there? So what I would say is, uh, well, great question. Firstly, why do we want them there, right? If this is saying that that all the conditions are such that it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to get them there, I don't know we, if we should be planting them there, right? We could look on this side. We have similar areas here on the side where there where there isn't currently grazing, right? So there's still bald quote unquote oak bald spots on this other side. Same thing. I would say, hmm, there's just something about the dryness. There's something about the the orientation of the hillside, whatever that. Mm, probably going to be really tough to get oak trees there. So we have two different approaches. There, there's two broad pathways. Maybe we just absolutely need, need an oak tree in this spot, right? So maybe it's going to be key, uh, a key perch for an endangered bird that we're introducing. And that we've determined that the bird really needs, really needs um, uh, uh, um, you know, a roost right here. In that case, what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to be very aggressive in terms of the planting. So we want to make sure we have irrigation, definitely have, say, plumbed in irrigation to that site. We want to make sure that we have maybe some fencing around that site to make sure that deer, browse, or whatever else does not happen. Um, and we're going, and so, so we could do something like that. We could do like very aggressive for that particular site if there's a reason to do that, right? If there's a specific, if there's another restoration goal or another key uh, management a driver that's going to make us want to do that. Or another example, maybe it's on the pathway where a bunch of moms stop with their kids, right? I don't want to be I, I, moms or dads. I don't want to be, I don't want to be, uh, you know, don't want to offend anybody. So, so parents, maybe there's a bunch of where parents pull off the trail and, and, and have lunch with their kids, right? So maybe uh, it, would, it would be great to have shade here so that these folks would have a better recreational experience, okay? So all those could be total reasons why we want an oak tree there. And we could, and we could get an oak tree to grow there, right? But short of that, short of having a specific reason why we need a specific oak in this area or a specific organism in this particular location, I would say, don't waste your time. It's gonna be a whole hell of a lot of work and it's gonna be difficult to get it growing there. Instead, I would say, 
let's okay and, and again if we don't have that specific need in that specific location let's shift over a little bit to this yellow area or a little bit more to this green area right and let's 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 put our plantings in there and we could do all the same stuff we could bring in irrigation we could put in um um a, a, a fencing and and things like that to deter to, to deter grazing and uh it, it's going to be much more now there's never a guarantee all of our stuff may may fail but we're going to be much more likely to succeed in these uh, yellow or green areas so i would say one why do we want to be planting in that bald area and if we do cool if there isn't a strong reason let's let's avoid planting there let's go to a better place that's more conducive to that organism uh, living is that cool yeah, that's good that makes a lot of sense thank you very much okay good other questions that people have about this stuff okay then i'll finish and we'll go on to our little activity here so i'll just say uh, to wrap this up um i've been i've just been talking about all these things grazing right so we talk about people trashing things we talk about vandalism we talk about cattle all these things that, that can stress the ecosystem right or stress our area and a lot of times we view them as oh my gosh those are how do i say it's enemies of us all right or they're, they're, they're in opposition to us because we're trying to make trees and they're these forces are acting to take away trees or we're trying to make more clean wetlands and these areas are acting to soil our wetlands or what have you um uh, and so I just want to end with this quick talk about since we're talking about oak trees and this is we could talk about this later on we talk about how we do these restorations but but um we just want to mention it here which is as much as possible we should be trying to take what we consider stressors and turn them into assets now I'm not naive I know you can't always do this but much more often than not you can you can with some with open hearts and open minds and and truly welcoming approaches we can oftentimes turn a liability into a benefit or an asset. So I'll just mention really briefly how that could work or how that worked in, in some of my oak woodland plantings. So this is uh, our, this is the, um, my area. So the area again that I worked, that I was in charge of was called the dish. So all those images I've been showing you are from the dish. And, um, and I installed some person counters. So how many? So, th so this was Stanford University property, but it was gated. It was it was the whole big region was fenced off. There were trails accessible to everybody. Anybody in the public, you didn't have to be a university student. Anybody could come and recreate there, walk on the trails, etc. Um, we wanted you to stay on the trails, but you could walk on the trails, and most of them were paved, so they're very nice. If you had a bike, or if you, you know, had a stroller, or in a wheelchair, or something like. Well, some of them were steep, but but you could move on them. So it's a, it was a great welcoming place for folks of different abilities to get out into nature, people that maybe would have a harder time on some dirt trails or things. So it was really cool, really cool. It is a really cool resource. Um, uh, but one of the first things I did was I said, how many people use this space? And the people like, just like before, just like all those other quotes, well, I think there's a lot of people. And I was like, what are you talking about? How many people use this place, right? And so, um, so I installed these counters and then I um, was able to get some data and I compared this to other open spaces where there was data available in the, in the San Francisco Peninsula. And so these are, so this is my area that I was working on. These are other uh, open space, other parks uh, in and around the area. And so most of these folks had really bad data, but I had really good data. So that's why the, the error bars are generally super, uh, super wide. But this is how many visitors came to the site standardized by area, because some of the areas are huge, some are small. So standardized by, by area. So the number of visitors per year per, per hectare. And actually over time, every year I worked there, this number started going up and up and up and up. And our efforts to restore stuff and, and do more public outreach worked incredibly well. And this place was, was, is still swamped with visitors, which is a blessing and a curse. One of the things that happened when people come to this and we might see the same thing at Ash Avenue next week when we go out there. But, but you know, we work on restoring it, making this place more attractive, making it more welcoming, making it you know more fun and cool and all that kind of stuff and interesting, healthy. One of the things that starts to happen is more people come. And in our case, the, we want people to stay on the trails, but people were often going off the trails. 
So people go off trails, do a little drinky drinky, do a little smoky smoky, you know, different things like that, all the things that young people do and et cetera. Um, and, you know, going off trails and drinky drinky, that's not good. It's causing erosion. It's inducing more people to go off trail, et cetera. But, but going off trail and smoky smoky is a real danger, right? Not just to the environment, but potentially starting fires. So we started tracking um, uh, how many times I saw people off trail, how many times essentially um, someone else saw and called campus security, that kind of deal. And this is what we saw. So we saw, uh, you know, in the cold time of the year, rainy time of the year, not many people were going off trail because it was muddy and cold and not many people were out there in general. But as we started to move into the, the spring and summer, we started to get more and more and more. And that sometimes we would get insane numbers of people going off trail. And these are only the ones that we observed or have documented. So there's a lot more going on. So, oh my gosh, we've started making this place attractive. Um, uh, you know, what, and this, this, for example, um, became the number one place to walk your dog in the San Francisco Bay Area. If you think about that, San Francisco Bay Area, huge, huge area, city of San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, all kinds of rural communities. This place was a mecca for dog walkers, including professional dog walkers. So I would see minivans pull up, a guy get out, open the door, and like 15 dogs would jump out. And then he'd leash them all up. One of these, you know, like Silicon Valley executives that have a lot of dogs, I want my dog taken care of. And so they'd hire somebody to take care of their dog in the daytime. And so we get these massive fleets of dog walkers. So anyway, all the, all the craziness you'd think of from crazy dot com wealthy people. Um, anyway, uh, so, so there's all kinds of stressors. And so one way to think about that is, oh my God, we're, we're seeing more and more visitors. There's, oh, there's more kinds of trash, there's more problems or whatever. What we can do is you can sensei that, right? And wax on, wax off that sucker and turn it into a positive. And that's what we did. So when we started doing this from one of our restoration experiments. When we started doing plantings and the oak trees are inside these little, well, there's oak trees at various places here, but, but you can see the oak trees most conspicuously inside these little cages we've put in. And, and so this is how we would do this with me and my assistants. This is my colleague, uh, Jeff Shinsky, who uh, I brought up from UCLA with me. He started diving with me when he was a little guy. And then uh, now he's a, a professor uh, uh, up in the Bay Area and, um, and very proud, very proud of my, of my old monkey. Um, but anyway, uh, so I would have, you know, him and assistants helping me with this, but this was, this was a lot of planting and a lot of work. And so we started doing these public planting days, which is a fantastic tool in conceptualizing your restoration, particularly if you don't have much money, particularly if it's a site where people might come to in the future, right? If this was on a military base sequestered away from people, mm, I guess we could do it. But if it's in a place where the public can access it, this is a fantastic tool. So in this case, rather than us doing all the public planting, we just got everything ready, okay? We got the equipment, we got the tools, we got some water, we got some muffins, right? And we, we broadcast it. This was really before there was social media. I know that you guys have no idea what that was, but this is, we would put advertisements out in the newspaper, um, that kind of stuff, flyers around. And, and you do it on a weekend when people are off work, and all this and that, and in the morning when it's not hot yet, and you get all these people coming out and they dig for you and they plant for you and they do the initial watering for you. And so in this case, here's this little family that's just planted this one oak tree, which is super cool. We've planted the oak tree. We've put some rock around it to help keep some of the weeds away and they've watered it in. So if this works well, every time this family comes by this site, not only are they helping us do the actual you know, the doing of the restoration, but they now have an investment, right? This is now their oak tree, right? So as this family comes back, maybe they come back every day to go on a run. Maybe they come back once a year at Christmas time when they're having a family reunion or something, but they can, they will say, and they will remember this. And I've seen this in many, many instances. People say, I planted that tree. There's my tree. And so it, it helps give investment and it gives ownership and it gives buy-in. And so now we've gone from something that might be a liability, all these people walking by, to these folks now might become an advocate for you. They might become an advocate of this site. And when they see someone off trail or they see something amiss, they will let that person know or they'll let the authorities know or they'll let you know that something's going on. If they see some rare critter, they're much more likely to say, hey, um, uh, did you notice that I saw this whatever woodpecker in this, in this site? So 
So um, as, we're, as we're doing the conceptualization, sometimes when we're, we're near urban centers or there's lots of vandalism or there's something we're like, oh my God, how am I gonna handle this? See how we can turn that into an asset. Maybe we can use those folks that are spray painting. Maybe they can make some welcome murals for us or some interpretation uh, signs for us, right? So, so it doesn't always work. I'm not, again, not Pollyannish about this or naive about this, but, but oftentimes we can tweak stuff and get better community buy-in and that's always gonna lead to greater restoration success. Cool? All right, I think we'll stop there. All right, cool. Okay, so 